Welcome to Chapter 5 of the book, The Fourth Wall, by Dr. Larry M. Van Hook. This chapter is a bit creepy. In this chapter, the author creates a plot device to imagine another behind-the-curtain experience for the reader and to elicit some thought about the unseen world. Knowing that God has written a story of reality, the author imagines how the critic tries to pervert the grand narrative and lead his children astray. This chapter and the next few illustrate this point that we are apt to create our own story apart from the one we are actually in. Notice how the demon is good at countering God's wonderful message with lies and doubts. Hang on for the ride, and like, subscribe, comment, and share. Chapter 5 Interview with Obazuth This time there was no book to enter. Instead, Ariel led me to a large open door of bronze and wood. As we approached the entrance I could see darkness above, but a staircase going down. Angels were ascending and descending. There were no humans. She explained that only God could write the characters of the story. However, as I was immaterial in spirit, Ariel said I could go under escort. There is something you need to include in your notes on your tablet from the earth, she said. She did not seem enthusiastic, however. We are going down to the earth, she said with a look of concern. The mighty angels of Michael made a major capture in your part of the story, and it must be revealed. She gave me a pair of slippers and said, Here, put these on. I looked at her, puzzled, but did as I was told without question. Immediately after we crossed the threshold, Ariel placed her hand on an incandescent panel and said something in another tongue. Nothing apparently changed around us, but we began our journey down the steps. Other heavenly pedestrians continued to climb or descend, looking disinterested in us. It seemed so pedestrian for a cosmic journey. I wondered how far heaven was from the earth this way. She read my thoughts and said, Don't worry. Space-time is part of the grand story. I assumed that meant a short walk rather than a long one. I suppose I was correct because we hiked for only twenty minutes, passing doors at various levels along the way. Each story was a different color, and the doors had identifying markings. I didn't know their meaning, but I suppose they carried some information about that level. I asked Ariel why we traveled to the Grand Story this way, but it was by the mist when I arrived. Seeming preoccupied, she replied, No translation going back. We are in the spirit already. She seemed unusually succinct and serious, so I stayed quiet until we stopped at a particular level. It was forest green, and the door was a dark red. Wait here, she commanded as she opened the door and walked through the entrance. I could see her talking to some other angels who looked concerned, with one shaking his head incredulously. However, they bowed respectfully, and Ariel returned to usher me into the space. Okay, come she said. I walked through the door into a large room that looked like a church with a stage of instruments positioned along the back. There were electric guitars, a keyboard, and a set of drums behind some glass directly in front of a maroon curtain. There was a single cross on the wall to the left, and below that was a table, probably a communion table. A cloth banner was above the table to the right of the cross. It had a rainbow design in the word love. On the other side of the stage was another rainbow banner with the word Dignity. We are about to go into another room. The humans call it the Fellowship Area. I must warn you. What you are about to experience is nothing like what you have encountered in heaven or on earth. But you must write what you see and hear, she firmly said. Is this what was captured by Michael's angels? I asked. She answered in a hushed tone. They are the Lord's angels under the charge of Michael. But yes, they have captured a demon we have been hunting since creation. As the Lord's angels battle the forces of darkness, some run to other parts of creation to cause trouble. Remember, billions of fallen angels are legion for every human. Most of them are subordinate to the princes or the higher-ranking demons. These higher-ranking demons jockey for territory and have specialties. They reveal themselves as gods so they can be worshipped. They also have very human-like anger, grudges, and hatred. Also, note that they can change their appearance unless in our chains. Unchained, they can look like one of us and appear male or female. They can appear like haunting apparitions. 
they can enter your physical body and mess with the wiring. As spirits, they have limited ability to alter the story directly unless they use humans, but they have figured out how to do some things. Remember they were once like us. We can appear in human form and follow God's imagination in the story. However, they now avoid demonstrative behaviors because they want you to disbelieve in them or continue the naive belief of your sophistication. You are interrogating this one because of where you were in the grand story and have been given authority from the Lord Jesus. This one was on her way to occupy one who would kill one of your Supreme Court justices, but we caught her before she got there to finish the job. I am interrogating a demon? I asked incredulously. Here, back in the story, I felt trepidation once more. She touched my head as if blessing me, saying, Remember to whom you belong and follow. This must be done and put into your tablet. Ask whatever you want. The Holy Spirit will guide you. We walked down a hall into a room with white plastic tables and chairs. The walls had more rainbow banners and other pictures. The wall was off-white with scuff marks from people's feet near the bottom, showing a fair amount of use. Behind us as we entered was a small kitchen with paper plates and cups on an island. There were no curtains on the two windows on the left. The lights were off, presumably because no human was in the building. Next to this room were two restrooms, but it wasn't clear which was the men's or women's restroom. We went into what I think was the men's restroom. A horrific figure guarded by two angels was chained to one of the urinals. The chains were of glowing metallic material, one on each wrist held by the two angels. Another set of chains was around her feet, fastened firmly to the urinal. The demon appeared female, with jet black hair, eyes just as dark, and a deathly pale greenish complexion. She wore armor that had rusted over time and had a raggedy blood-red cloak, the spectacle was every bit like any horror movie you could imagine. As soon as we stepped into the room, the supernatural tattered Amalian let out a pitched scream that sounded like a startled baby goat, which caught me off guard and made me jump. Yet, Ariel remained unfazed, even as the heinous beast aggressively lunged toward us, tugging on her chains and bellowing out a wicked laugh. <laughs> Thinking I should act as confident, I asked the demon my first question. What is your name? Who are you? She screeched. Are you connected to this place? Are you a minister? My favorite servants are pastors. We own lots of those mealy-mouthed fence-sitters. Again, I demand. Who are you? I asked, ignoring her boasts. I could feel the security of the two guarding angels dressed in their armor of reflective silver. They had on their belts what looked like the grips of swords, but there were no blades. I am called Obizuth, the willing slave of Baal Moloch, and his consort Asherah, Queen of Heaven, replied as if frustrated but with some pride. I destroy innocence with them. And why are you here? I asked. If you must know, I was invited, she hissed. She saw the surprise on my face. You don't know just how successful we are, she continued with an evil grin. Anticipating my next question, she said, Destroying innocence. I am the destroyer of children. I supply sacrifices to my master. If we cannot kill them, we make them objects of lust. It is all so pleasurable for us, especially Ashera. King Moloch prefers their destruction, she continued as if bragging. My job is to get you humans to sacrifice your children to him. I have done very well. Not sure what I should ask to put in the tablet, I asked. Where are Moloch and Ashera? She leaned back and loosened the tension on the chains. Wouldn't you like to know so you could capture them too? But I don't know. Moloch's altar is at the Bohemian Grove and Ashera's temples are in Hollywood and New York. Ariel whispered in my ear. Michael has chased them from the land of Israel to Europe and now North America. But these handsome devils holding me already knew that, don't you boys? Obizuth said as she turned and looked at the disgusted angels who kept her bound. She began to laugh. She turned back ominously and looked at me, her eyes piercing the darkness with red. How does it feel to know you are nothing? Nothing? I'm right here in front of you, besides, how can I feel nothing? Ariel looked concerned that I was allowing this line of questioning. Obasuth, however, continued. 
You are nothing but words on a page. Close the book, and you don't exist. You are being made up right now. Someone is typing your story, she beamed. You aren't real. I looked at Ariel as if to ask for help. I was confused. Ariel looked back with an assuring nod. It is a metaphor of reality to help us humans understand, I said, losing my bearing. No, it isn't, she snapped. You are merely a story, and probably a story within a story. You don't matter. At least we stirred the pot. We fought back. We were the ones who gave you knowledge. Yet not all of you serve us. She created anxiety that led to anger, so I said, You are trying to destroy God's story and take God's place. She rattled her chains dismissively. You think you can argue with me? Ask yourself how we could even try it if God were so powerful. Maybe he isn't as good an artist as you think. We bring freedom because we keep the story from ending. God knows that he cannot finish the story if it is still ugly. That would be an admission of his failure. Besides my story, the story of Lilith is so much better. They got me, but my story is out there now. She laughed with a screech that shook the room. See, I am destroying your innocence, she howled. Now you know. Seemingly getting the upper hand, she continued. Either God isn't all-powerful or he isn't all-good. He let us do evil in his sight. He even rejected his chosen people to be burned in the Nazi gas chambers. That permit made Moloch very happy since the destruction of fire burns within him. Even your people who helped Michael chase us from Europe, let me put 60 million babies in his arms. Did not God say, I form the light and create darkness? I make peace and create evil. I the Lord do all these things. He commanded Satan to steal, kill, and destroy Job's life. He struck Miriam with leprosy, merely for challenging her brother Moses. We didn't do that. Your sacred storyteller did that. She hissed and laughed, finding pleasure in her blasphemies and hatred. Ariel whispered in my ear. She is filibustering, creating doubt. Keep her on one topic. Obizuth noticed and shouted, Who is this that whispers in your ear? Ariel, is that you? I haven't known you or seen you since you opposed us. Human. She isn't so wise. Even now, some of you humans think what she taught you is so much bunk. Even now they laugh at your story. They agree with us that you are nothing. Yet, man's wisdom is greater than hers because we have taught you. We gave you science. We taught you to be your own god. Noticing her chains again, I interjected. Am I not here looking at you? Do I not see your chains? On Earth, I have seen the chains you put us under, so I am not buying what you are selling. I have seen when the Lord laid the foundation of the universe. I saw his mighty hand instruct the waters when the morning stars sang together, and the angels shouted for joy. Am I to listen to you? Do you challenge the holy place of God? You listen to me because you need something for your tablet, she said unfazed. Yes, I challenge God. Don't act like you are surprised, you fool. Our stories are better, especially mine. What is your master's strategy here? I demanded an answer. It isn't so hard to decipher yourself from this part of the story. These humans are so gullible. We convince them that God is pleased with their wickedness. We call evil good and good evil. Their lusts and deception enslave them. Now they gaslight, as you say, the rest of us. We just let these people loose in the church like rats infecting the plague which was our doing, by the way. Again, she acted as if honored by her own words. How did you fool them? This time I was calm, trying to get her to reveal more through her boasts. We tell them they make up their own story, something we are trying to do. We make them like us by revealing that the world is just a social construct, she said, laughing at their credulity. You humans will forget the difference between male and female, or assume to counsel God. If we can't destroy you, God will anyway. It is our perfect plan. Just then, one of the angels guarding Obizuth warned that humans were beginning to enter the church building, and that the time was short. What is your master's plan next? You think I will tell you? I fear Moloch more than Michael. Michael has won a victory by capturing me. 
for Baal will suffer less sacrifice, but many of his possessions are still in power. God has turned your land over to us because of your wickedness, she finished with a howl. Screeching noises were heard approaching like a legion of wild pigs in the further reaches of the building. If the parishioners had listened to what we did, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Yet, they entered oblivious to their slavery to the demons around them. The angel guards asked, Ariel, let us leave, for we too alone cannot fight the hundreds of demons approaching with the people. Give us our leave. Ariel said, Go. Immediately, the demons pulled Obazuth by the feet and hands, presumably to take her to the prison prepared for her and the others of her kind. Ariel took me outside and placed me on a landing near the roof of the building. Facing me squarely and pointing at my chest, she directed, We will not have to engage in battle here. Our mission was to give you words for your tablet so that the humans may be warned. Even now they have lost themselves in their arrogance and depravity. Judgment is close. Give thanks to God that you arrived home for the tribulation about to befall the earth. It will only grow worse. Your people have suffered a humiliating defeat by your enemies, and pestilence is approaching. They will experience an even greater lack because they have rejected the one true artist. Famine is coming to them, and God himself will bring them low. His people who claim his name have turned themselves over to idols. They will offer their seed as sacrifice and reap destruction upon themselves. Woe to those on the earth in a nation that has rejected the true story, who dishonor God with their bodies, who sacrifice their children to Moloch and encourage others also, who think they can buy God's blessing, who boast in their own righteousness. God is coming down to lay them low unless they repent. For I tell you the truth, the age of the Gentiles has ended. Jesus is already beginning to restore his story to the lost house of Israel. She took me by the hand as I pondered this, and continued, Come, you have written about the ruling spirits. Now, I need to show you some deceiving spirits.